very much indeed, Lawrence, and uh, thank you all indeed for coming along this evening to, to listen to me. Uh, I sometimes say with uh, these talks that you know, there's always a risk that you're going to upset one part of the room <laughs> at any one time, uh, but hopefully not all parts of the room at the same time. Uh, so I'll try and talk to you as frankly as I can, uh, and I think I'll talk, that means really totally frankly in these circumstances, uh, about really how I see uh, Australian foreign policy doing right now um, under a government that's been in power about uh, six months or so. Uh, and I should just you know, say there, straight off, that I always think it's kind of tough to judge a government on foreign policy until it's been around a year. It's a very difficult exercise to get into if you've been out of power a number of years. Uh, and it's uh, and it's tough, and mistakes are, make, are made. So I, I don't want to just uh, you know, suggest that uh, ministers are, uh, have been in error or been silly, uh, which tends to happen in the media a bit, I just recognise how tough it is to get it right all the time. And even when you've been around a long while, you still make mistakes. But the first year is always problematic. So I, I think uh, I want to give them a bit of slack on that, first off. Uh, I'd like, like just make a, f a few general comments, uh, if I may, about how I see our foreign policy having evolved as a nation, which will give me, I think, a little bit of a, a basis to comment on, on you know, how this government's going right now. Um, the first point is, uh, if you look back, and I tend to, to look back at the time I've spent in, in this game, Australia uh, actually hasn't done too badly. You bear in mind that the Second World War, we really didn't have much of a foreign policy. We hadn't done much between the First and Second World um, sure, there were issues between the Commonwealth, within the Commonwealth, there were issues as between the British and the Americans, uh, and so on. Uh, we were beginning to realise that we would have to do something with Asia, where we would have to develop our own policies. But by and large, we really only started in the, in the post-war period. And if you look at that, I think we've done quite well. Uh, and I see you know, several areas of that policy having developed. One was with Indonesia, and we're still you know, our ongoing issues with Indonesia are going to be there. We're, ne we're never going to get totally rid of, of differences and difficulties with Indonesia. Um, if you look at the proximity of the country, the number of things that happen between Indonesia and Australia, the fact that our cultures are very different, our histories are very different, stages of development are very different, it's never going to be straightforward, and I'll come back to that. But if you look at where we started with Indonesia and the ups and downs, by and large, uh, I don't think Australia's managed to too badly, with some gaps, with some real deficiencies now and again. The other area of Southeast Asia, which we've had to, you know, perforce quite vigorously at times, a developer of a set of relationships and quickly was what I call mainland Southeast Asia. And, and for a start, that was the whole Indochina exercise going from the 50s right through until uh, really the Cambodian settlement, which gave us a knowledge and an understanding of those countries, which I think uh, has stood us well. I'm not here trying to suggest that our going into Vietnam was necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. What I'm saying is the policy development over that period was reasonably solid, and I think uh, while we still make a lot of mistakes with Southeast Asia, we have a pretty serious knowledge, and what is perhaps less realised, uh, a web of relationships with those countries of Southeast Asia. Then there was the economic uh, relationships which we developed with Northeast Asia uh, initially, um, which are still the foundation of our foreign policy, our policy policies towards those countries. It is impossible, in my view, to underestimate the importance of resources in the development of Australia's foreign policy. It gave us a place at the table with the Japanese, with the Koreans, with the Chinese, and now with the Indians. Now, if you were an Australian minister, you would never say this. But a lot of the time, the reason we're taken seriously in these countries 
and in the economic, in economic inter, international economic dealings generally, is because of our strength and resources. And it has a lot to do with the development of our foreign policy with Northeast Asia and remains crucial. What has of course happened in the last 15 years or so is a strategic dimension has been added to our relations with Northeast Asia. And that is because of uh, obviously the problems in Korea, uh, our relationship with Japan, which is close, and it's probably the closest relationship we have in Asia. I don't, I don't really have much doubt about that. And uh, also, of course, the rise of China and how we deal with that. And then I think the, the fourth you know, main stage, and we're only really beginning that, is, and that's the fact that we've taken India uh, seriously for the last decade or so, after a lot of ups and downs. Add to that uh, a sort of stop-start, far from perfect management of our relations in, in the South Pacific, where I suspect, you know, had we taken it more seriously earlier, we could have done a lot better. And uh, I've always found it surprising as a person who hasn't had very much experience in the South Pacific, how lightly we dealt with the South Pacific for so many years. We were concentrating on Indochina. We wanted to be seen in the halls of greatness in Washington and London. Uh, we wanted to be a serious player in Northeast Asia and all the rest. And we weren't really taking much notice of what is happening in our backyard. And I'm still not sure we give it the policy coverage that we should. Well, that comes from somebody who's not really an expert in the area, but I have a sort of feeling I'm right on that. Um, where I think we've uh, probably uh, had difficulties in the way we have, uh, I should just mention, multilaterally we've done okay. You know, the G20 that we see today has a lot to do with Rudd. To be fair, it has a lot to do with it. I mean, he would tell you that many times louder, but, 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 it, but, it, but, it, but it really does. Equally, APEC, the East Asia Summit, all that had a lot of Australian input. Uh, APEC, in starting the whole thing up, East Asia Summit, in uh, growing it to include the United States and, and, and Russia. So we've done pretty well uh, regionally, and, and I think multilaterally. I think it's kind of a pity that, you know, in relation to multilateral organizations as a whole, we tend to blow hot and cold according to which government we have in power. Uh, but, uh, and we do, uh, and I think it's a mistake because one thing that people look for overseas is a certain measure of serious continuity in foreign policy. And I think we unnecessarily go up and down in that area. Um, but that's, uh, it seems to be a, become a sort of ideological issue here in Australia, and I think it's rather a pity. Um, I think the, the areas where we've been weak uh, in our foreign uh, policy endeavours are twofold. One is I don't think we've ever got public diplomacy right as a country, and there's no sign of that improving. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I am, uh, I, I, I have, as Murray Green will tell you, I have done some work for the ABC, but I'm saying this unrelated to that. Uh, I think television is an important tool of public diplomacy. I've just lived in too many countries where I've seen it operating to, to know that as a fact. And I think public diplomacy is particularly important where you are a country, as we are in Australia, that is surrounded by countries with a very, very different history, culture, governmental tradition. We are different to the Canadians, whose country of prime foreign policy focus is the United States, secondly, of course, the United States is crucial to us, but right on our doorstep, you have all these countries which just think and work differently to us. Hence, there is a greater need for Australians to explain what our country is about in dealing with our neighbours than for most others. If you're British or Dutch, something you're basically concentrating on Europe and the United States. British different because they had an empire, but but that's I think the point is still valid. Uh, Canada, I think, is probably the best example. Uh, anyway, we need to do more on that. And we've, you know, and there is a realization in some parts of, of government that we need to do more on that. It was behind the Henry Report, which, you know, I think was maligned uh, in some ways. It wasn't, in the end, written very well, and that's because everybody had a chunk of it. And uh, secondly, you know, 18 ministers or something wanted to say they had something to do with it, so it all got awfully messy. The opposition then felt obliged to damn it with faint praise, and 
it was a pity because there was a lot of very good work in it, including contributions from all members of the Australian community, which I think people, we've tended to lose sight of that a bit, or it's been lost sight of, let's put it that way. And that is, uh, that's regrettable. But, you know, there really is, uh, uh, that side of our policy has, has always been bad. I think it's been bad whichever government has been in power. The second problem we have, and I really don't know how to deal with this, all I'm doing uh, to quote a comment I heard recently is admiring the problem. I'm not coming up with any resolution. And that is our political style. Uh, I can admire the problem of our political style. I've done it for 45 years, but I haven't been able to come up with a solution to it. And that is basically because, uh, because we work in a Western tradition, Western democratic tradition, with an enormous amount of attention paid to the media, even for a Western democracy. And because increasingly we need to get stuff out quickly because of the 24-hour news cycle, uh, we can all too often, uh, as a country, or uh, governments within our country, say things which are <coughs> said to appease domestic opinion in particular circumstances without taking sufficient attention to the paying to sufficient attention to the, the, the foreign policy consequences. And uh, you see it all the time. Now, other countries do it, of course they do it. My comment would be merely that we do it more. And I don't know what to do about it. Uh, to repeat this comment, I'm just admiring the problem. I don't have any solutions because I think even if I voiced my opinions, I, I think nobody would take really much, pay much attention to it. It's a national bad habit. Okay, <laughs> now I move away from that. Um, next point, which I think we have to bear in mind before really commenting on the foreign policy challenges before us, is that 85% of Australia's foreign policy really would be the same, whichever government is in power. Where you get criticism one way or the other tends to be on the methods used. If one party, the government, seems to be making a mistake or not handling an issue very well, the opposition will pounce on that. But it doesn't mean to say the policy itself would be any different. For example, uh, you know, these issues with Indonesia, of course the government's been criticised by the opposition but I don't know that they would be handling it all that differently were they in power. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't, actually. Um, but you know, that is, I think, you know, a very important point to, uh, to understand about our policy. Where, of course, you have seen very major differences in the past have been when we go to war, but not always just when we go to war, but mainly when we go to war. The big policy difference that I can remember in my working lifetime was Vietnam. Uh, there was also uh, a big policy difference, but actually not that big, on Iraq. By and large, and there were differences on nuclear issues in the 80s, including relations with the United States, <coughs> between the two parties. But on the whole, they were managed. So most of our policy differences uh, are really can be, you know, I think, contained down to 10 or 15%. And the rest of it's basically rhetoric. Um, okay. Having said all that, uh, where are we going uh, now? Uh, how what are the foreign policy challenges chasing to pursue the face faced by this government right now? Let me just go through a few of them. I don't really want to try and cover the waterfront because that's difficult and it can be kind of boring too, you just sort of say, you know, and then there is and, uh, and go on. Look, um, first off, this issue of refugees. This is a heated question, I, and I, I suspect my perspective is not something that everybody will agree with here. Uh, I buy that. And, um, you know, most of the people I know, I suppose, or I mix with, would tend to be very critical indeed of the policy of either government in relation to refugees. That's fine. And I was kind of that view until I was talking about nine months ago to a somebody who's now minister, you know, a minister in this government. And we were having a discussion on this. And he said, well, but what would you do about it? And I had a problem. Because most of the solutions that I felt comfortable with just wouldn't work. 
in the present day political environment in Australia. Now you can say the creation of that political environment is the fault of both political parties and the degree it is. They've heated it up, no question. But the fact is we're facing certain issues. One is uh, if you uh, do your processing in Australia, the people who know a lot about this say it is more than certain that you will attract more and more people to the country. So that means you're having to look at some sort of offshore solution. Now, looking at uh, the refugee issue, uh, how do I see it going? I think actually it's probably going reasonably well for the government in terms of dealing with the problem of people coming down, illegal boats arriving. I think the signs of that, the statistics are all showing that. It seems to me that the way I try and look at it, uh, there are three aspects to this issue in a policy context. The first is deterrent. And I think you have to have a deterrent to people coming down. Uh, I don't think any government in our sort of uh, society can afford not to. In some way, you have to stop the place being an attractive magnet for people to come in illegally. Now, from that perspective, uh, I would say that the policies of the last months of the Rudd government and the policies of the Abbott government uh, have been successful. Unpleasant, but successful. You then, however, move to your second issue, and that is our duty as a humanitarian, decent country. And you have to say that the policies of either government uh, fail under that heading. What do you do about it? Well, I don't know that you can do much right now. I would say, by the way, the policy of turning back the boats under a humanitarian heading is much more positive than the camps in PNG, in Manus and Nauru. Okay, but what do you do to behave as a decent country in these circumstances? And I'd say there are two ticks in this. First of all, you know, we have to face up to it people who are critical of the policy, there are nothing like as many people dying. People are not dying at sea any longer. I think that's pretty important. The second thing I would say, and I would argue, and this I don't think would find much favour with this government, it would, would have found favour with some in the former government, and indeed did, and that is, while you keep up a very, very hard line on deterrence, you are much, much more generous in the number of places you give to genuine refugees coming out of all the camps that are affected by these issues. And that would be going into the Middle East. So you double your intake to 35. Everybody would gulp and say, oh, we can't do it. In fact, we could. But it wouldn't be something that would be attractive to this government, I don't think. But I think it would do our reputation, which has been very severely dented, make no mistake about that. It has been very severely dented. We have to face up to that. It would at least do us some good and we'd be doing the right thing. Now the third area is, which I think is important in trying to get a policy together on refugees, boat people, call them what you will. And that is international relationships. And that basically comes down to Indonesia. In terms of reputation, it's much wider than that. But as a specific policy problem, it's really Indonesia. And uh, it's a very, very difficult issue to deal with in Indonesia right now. And I think that the uh, only way I can see going forward is this, that I think the policy is actually working. And it may well be that within six months, it is not an actual problem with Indonesia, because people are simply not getting on boats to come out any longer. Where I think we should really, again, keep trying to persuade the Indonesians to see our perspective is that there is some duty incumbent upon them to deal with people who are leaving illegally on Indonesian boats with Indonesian crews. Some duty 
incumbent of Parliament to take them back. Now, the government, of course, has tried to that, tried that, but it is the only policy that I can see uh, as a clear policy uh, in relation to dealing with Indonesia and the relationship with Indonesia. Now, okay, that's in that chunk I've done refugees. Now, the next chunk I move under as the next issue is Indonesia, because that is intimately related, as, as apparently from what I've just said, to the refugee problem. Now, right now we've got two big issues, or three issues, I'd say, with Indonesia that are problematic. Uh, first of all, refugees. We're pushing boats back, albeit humanely, which they don't want to have come back because it's embarrassing for them, it's humiliating for them, and it's not being done with their consent. Big issue. But the second problem, of course, is this question of uh, the bugging of the president. Now, I think it's a mistake for either country actually to relate the two, and I think it's a pity for Indonesia to have linked the two issues which they have. They're saying, you know, no prog progress on intelligence gathering and so on, or vote people, or legal migration, until we sort out the bugging issue. I think it's a pity they've done that because it may cause us a lot of problems, but it's not really doing them any good either over the longer term. But, but there it is, that's their policy choice. And they have elections up, and the politics up there are very murky right now. Now, the only thing I can think of, which is short of the government uh, radically changing course, and you know you can well say after the event that the initial handling of that issue in the first two days should have been different. You know, I can say that, but it, but it wasn't. That's the problem. What I think the government now, uh, you know, I would think would be the best thing it would be able to do would be this. It would be to look at some way of finding closure on the bugging issue, the spying issue. Now, I don't know how that's done. But mostly to get the relationship with Indonesia back on track again, when we've had problems in the past, and Timor is a classic case of this, you actually needed closure of the problem before you could move down the track again. Now, Timor, we got it. You know, once once you know, Timor was over, it was basically over. The government changed, uh, the UN came in, a whole lot of new procedures were put in place, it was over. And so we were able, at the end of about a year, with a different president and a different vice president, because Megawati was initially on this issue quite helpful, and then Gustu, we were able to change it. So in order really to put our relationship with Indonesia back on track, we need some sort of closure on these two issues. That's going to be very difficult to get, and I, I have no, you know, there's no miracle solution to it. But uh, some sort of discourse, some sort of discussion needs to close it off. And right now we have, as you will have read in the paper, this uh, series of steps uh, being discussed with uh, the Indonesian foreign, foreign minister, uh, Martin Atlagawa. Well, yeah, uh, fine, but we're running into elections and all this is going to be slowed up. So we've got really to try and sort out these two problems. It may be that we can do it in the next three months or so. My sense is it's going to sort of uh, gradually go off the front page unless new reports keep coming up. And then, you know, early next year, you know, we'll get back to some sort of normal normalcy because hopefully the boat flow will have ended and uh, the spying issue will have been dealt with, uh, one would hope, discreetly in such a way as face can be saved by both sides. Um, that would be my outlook on it. Something like that. But, you know, that could leave it difficult for about a year or so. Having said that, uh, it's only fair to those involved in this relationship that a lot is going on perfectly normally. You would, reading the newspaper, you would think, no, no, it's not going on normally. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just not happening. In fact, it is. Uh, there are constant defense exchanges at a very high level, education exchanges, uh, all this is happening. So that's where I see Indonesia. You know, unless you get closure on both these issues, it's going to be difficult to resolve them. Although, over time, it will sort itself out. But it might take a while, and it's not healthy. It's not good. Okay, the third issue 
uh, really. The, the next big issue that we're dealing with is Australia's dealings with the United States and China. But having said that, first off, I'd say one of the problems we have is we are tending as a country to see the issues in Asia right now as really between, just between the United States and China, with Australia kind of as a, you know, uh, you know, as a terrier running after and, you know, having comments to make all the time. And, you know, good, we haven't, we're entitled to a point of view, but we see it see as a sort of triangle. Um, and I think this is possibly the, the first mistake that we can make and continue to make, or we can make, and I think we're already beginning to make it, but it's only in the atmospherics. And that is, we need to understand that the Chinese principally, or in general, accept the nature of our relationship with the United States. They accept it's an alliance and they accept that we should behave as an ally. Um, I think, uh, so I don't necessarily think we are ipso facto causing damage to our relationship with China because we're an ally of the United States and we say positive things about the United States. I think there's several problems though. First of all, when we comment on what is happening in the East China Sea, that's to say between Japan and China, we tend to forget that this is a different issue for the Chinese than their relationship with the United States. Of course that's very closely woven into it. It's all tied into the politics of the Pacific. But this is an issue for the Chinese between themselves and the Japanese. That's how they tend to look at it. And Given that we don't take a position on sovereignty over the islands, we have to be particularly careful how we take positions on the what the Japanese are doing and what the Chinese are doing. <coughs> and uh, not everything the Japanese do is necessarily positive in terms of the region. Abe's visit to the Yasukuni Shrine is one case. Caused great bitterness and anger in China, also in Korea. You will see in the next few years, the Japanese will be amending what is known or reinterpreting what is known as Article 9 of their constitution. It affects what they do in terms of defense deployments around Japan. It affects what the relationship or what they do in conjunction with the United States. For example, I'll give you an example, because uh, an academic in Japan recently gave this. If right now the Japanese were to assist the United States in tracking a North Korean fighter in an incident over North Korea and the Americans shot that North Korean fighter down, the Japanese would be in breach of their constitution. Um, so, you know, there is a lot that they legitimately need to do to amend their constitution, or reinterpret their constitution, to ensure that it is consistent with present day realities. But how they go about this process, and it's going to be a very complicated and important process, will gravely affect the way they deal with the, with the Chinese and with the Koreans. And this really has to be very carefully watched. Now, with this set of issues, Australia has to be very careful about the words it chooses, how it gets into this set of issues. We would favour, I'm sure, uh, reinterpretation of Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. What they have been faced with has been terribly binding in the last 10 or 15 years. It's really cramped their style to a ridiculous extent. But how they go about that process is really going to affect the security of Northeast Asia. And it's very important they do that right. So we don't want to be coming up with a lot of comments which essentially, you know, uh, you know, the Japanese are our best friend and hence, you know, we're going to support them in whatever they do. We can't do that. It's got to be very, very carefully thought through and judged. And I think that will make a lot of difference. The other general point I want to make is, uh, again, it comes back to this trilateral issue. It's ourselves, the Americans and the Chinese. There are a lot of players in the region. Indians are very important. Their relationship with Japan is very important. The role ASEAN takes is very important. 
as a country, and I don't want to point the finger at the government here because I don't think they're particularly you know, guilty of making any mistakes here, but as a country, we need to see the set of issues as far more complicated than just that triangle of China, ourselves, and the Americans. But that really is going to be a tough issue to deal with. It's, it's one of the most important issues we had to deal with in 10 or 15 years. That set of relationships over the next five, 10 years or so, crucial to our security. We we'll, we'll have to be very, very smart on it. Um, look, the final point I just want to make is um, because you know I think people will obviously be very concerned about this. Is you know what is the government doing in terms of its uh, rhetoric on economic diplomacy and on development assistance? Well, the economic diplomacy stuff I, uh, I would personally have no problem with. It really, when it comes down to it, is it's pursuing these FTAs. Now, it's really important, and you say this about any government, whether it be Labour or Coalition, when you're pursuing an FTA, don't let the politics get in the way of the <coughs> trade advantages and disadvantages. And, you know, we've been guilty of this in the past. And, uh, I just, just think we've got to be very careful not to be uh, guilty of it again. The government's obviously very <coughs> keen on these FTA as well. You know, you're playing with some very tough customers on this stuff. Uh, you know, they are really tough and self-interested and, you know, we have to have to take that into account. The other issue which, you know, a number of people in Australia are concerned about is where um, we're going on development assistance. The bureaucratic changes, I don't necessarily, I, I'm not trying to be sort of uh, get out of facing the issue, I don't really have a view on that. I know people who are very positive and attach a lot of importance to development assistance see removing the bureaucratic entity or changing the bureaucratic ent entity as indicative of a loss of support for development assistance. I think it is. Uh, I think that's the case, no question. But I'm not sure whether over five years it's going to make too much difference to the way we do it, or whether it'll be necessarily detrimental to the way we do it. I do know that you know, when you move or try and blend organisations, it is a much, much tougher uh, process than outsiders would necessarily think it is. It's much more than just, you know, shoving people around a few desks and putting them into different divisions and so on. It's, it's really complex. And I think that's part of the uh, issue here. I think there are two points I want to make, though. <coughs> uh, I think it's a pity if we personally, if we lose sight of these targets, I think we made much of adhering to them and a lot of countries uh, do adhere to them. I think it comes down to, again, the sort of country we think we are. Well, uh, people have different views on that. I think it's a pity. But what I think also concerns me uh, very much, and that this is not just the issue of targets, uh, I would hate it if in this process, we went back on our undertakings. And that, I think we've partly done that by dropping targets, frankly, but what I would hate to see happen, something I've seen before happen, uh, and that is, you know, when you have said you are going to do something costing so much over five years, and you suddenly say after two and a half years, sorry, we're not gonna do it anymore. It's really a bad thing to do. And I hope that's not happening I haven't got close enough to individual programs to know, but that's a terrible thing to do to another country or group of people who are dependent on that input to get a very necessary program up and going. Probably enough, I think, uh, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.